welcome to the Make Life Rich movement. Thank you so much for coming on. Hi, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me. I'm just really excited to meet with you and talk more with you. I think it's a beautiful thing that you uplift business leaders and kind of shed light on really important topics. So thanks for having me today. Oh, thank you. I was so enamored with uh, just the overall topic that you cover. Your best friend shared um, a post of yours and I just briefly read what it was. I was like, oh my God, I'm in. I clicked on you, followed you, started stalking you, and then immediately asked you to come on the show. So guys, we are, list you're, you're listening to Carrie Eaton. She is the founder of the Kindred Collective and she specializes in friendship coaching, which is so needed these days. And you say that building lasting relationships is your superpower and you love helping women to meet their next best friend, which I love so much. I think that's so sweet. Um, I would just love to know like where your earliest memory of friendship kind of lies. And if you remember it, like give us a little breakdown of what, you know, I feel like our truest essence of who we are as people, especially as friends goes all the way back to like our little bitty baby time. So can you remember your earliest moments of friendship and what was that like for you? Yeah, absolutely. And just to share a little bit more about me personally, I actually grew up an introverted only child with two very extroverted parents. So because it was just us three, they were always taking me around, taking me to the neighbor's houses, taking me to their friends' houses. And of course, I got these opportunities to really build relationships with their friends' kids. Um, so we had a pretty tight-knit community growing up in our neighborhood. And I consider myself very grateful that I had these folks in close proximity to me where even though I didn't have siblings, um, I was able to start to build relationships. And I think now that I've accepted more of my introversion, I wasn't really sure what it was at first, um, but it wasn't always the easiest to make friends or understand how to relate with people my own age, especially in those early years. And so I really was put in this position where I had to learn pretty fast some social skills and um, really how to connect with others and develop those friendships, even at a young age, or else the alternative is I wouldn't have anybody. Um, so I do think it's interesting to reflect on. I think we have that close knit community in our neighborhood. And then also just thinking about even elementary school, there were the, the popular group of girls, there were other friends and other groups already starting to form and that that first and second grade age. And um, so, yeah, it's definitely interesting to reflect on. And it's valid that we start building those connections and kind of building up our own communities pretty young. Yeah, it's uh, it was so funny thinking through like the topic of friendship. And then once you had agreed to be on the show, I was like, OK, I'm going to ask her questions. I was like, what is the earliest friendship that I can remember? And I was definitely uh like three or four, but they were like hazy memories. The first one where I have like conversations I can remember was in preschool. I was four. It was another girl named Sarah. And I just remember so much of just the feeling of like happiness, like just running around and just the overall like smile on your face. You can't wipe off. And I think those times were taken for granted a little bit. It's like that beauty is lost on children and then society kind of like hammers into you a shell, whether it's self-consciousness or like every, every, there's so many different veins you could go through that could make you feel like you're not worthy or valuable towards other people to, to be friends with or have relationships with. And I wonder, as you being an only child, I learned a lot about relating to another person via like don't steal their toys. Don't smack them. Like you can't have their snacks. Like I have a younger sister. So I remember that learning curve. It was brutal, really brutal. My mom spoiled me to death and then my sister came. Then we were a family of, you know, two under two and that's a different dynamic of a mother. So for me as an older child, it was uh, abrasive to be like, oh wow, like I have to interact and mm. like, it's not all about me. Like I, nothing is self-centered on me anymore. So what was, if you can remember, some of the learning curve moments for you in getting to relate to other people and, and not totally having it like 
throw you off the map because you're so overwhelmed. I can imagine as an introvert, it had to be scary to just get thrown into these scenarios. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you touched on a couple of important things. I think the first being when you're a kid, our friendships are not nearly as complex as they are when we're adults. And it's because we only have so many priorities. We are concerned about play and we're concerned about what's our first sleepover going to look like and all of those things. And so it is interesting as we get older as our priorities change and as we start to form our identities as individual people, I think that's where our relationships and friendships get more nuanced. Um, And so I'll share a funny memory that I have early on because you asked about how do you learn these ways to connect with people or what's important in making friendships. And um, in first grade, I remember for me, it was approval. It was this concept of approval and how would I be liked by others? And so I brought in this fake little crystal rock to show and tell and told everybody that I had found it in my backyard with my parents and, um, you know, was sniffed out immediately. But I, it's again, interesting to reflect on the fact that at the core of that action or behavior was this need to be liked and approved and thought of as cool. Um, and so I think what's, what's interesting as more of an introverted personality is that you might not intuitively be able to reach out and connect with others um, instinctively, right? It's something you have to be intentional about. And I think if you can gain that approval or that consensus from Um, other people in your circle, then you might not have to reach out as much, right? Because they already have this perception of you that um, makes them want to be your friend. But I think what's interesting then thinking about more of those middle school ages, which is awkward and hard for everybody, um, but especially for those that are a little bit more introverted, you're wrestling a lot with your identity um, and how, who you are, what you like, and really are starting to be guided by some of these societal constructs or concepts that make somebody accepted or maybe more on the outside or outskirts. And so um, I think it's hard to reflect back because I wish you could almost like hug your, your younger self and just say, you know, you are perfect exactly as you are and you will find people that have the same interests as you and that Um, accept you exactly as you are, but we're navigating all of these things and learning about what really will lead society to embrace us as individuals and how does that impact um, kind of how we present ourselves to others. (laughs) One second. Yeah. Yeah. Let me write this down. You are so, I'm obsessed with you. Wait, what is your day job that has literally nothing to do with this? Yeah, no. You're a publicist. I'm obsessed with you. Like, you need to be, like, in magazines getting, like, here she goes. Sophie, cookie? Let's be quiet. I'm going to give you a cookie. We got her during COVID. My mom, we gave her to my mom during COVID. She got no training for a year. That's so sweet. Well, no, thank you for, like, the kind words. I really love your energy. The more I've watched your podcast, the more I've kind of (laughs) reverse stalked you as well. I'm like, I feel like we are really going to connect. So, um, and I love like hearing about your background in PR too, but my day job is really in relationship building and relationship management, but on the fundraising side of the house for nonprofit organizations. Cool. And yeah. that is still similar because that just requires more strategy, which is tough. Exactly. Yeah. And so- Sophie, please. It's no. uh strangers, you know? Yeah. And making them care about something they might not care about, but Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Please do it, sir. Sorry, he's so fast. Ooh, that jug just made me remember. I know. So are mine. It's so large. Um, but yeah, I was like, a little water break never hurts. Yeah. And feel free to do it during the show. I'll clip it out. Um, okay. I think we're in the clear. All right, what time are we at? And don't worry, I'll have you done at like eleven fifty five, no problem. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. We'll keep going. We'll start with the next question. You're so intelligent. I'm obsessed. Okay. So when we're thinking about the value that we provide to others in exchange for that kind of um, understanding of like, we're friends now, 
uh, as a child, you know, it's happening unconsciously. We're just like reacting. We want to be loved. We want to be liked. We learned a lot of this from our parents and how we have to interact with them to get the love that we want and like to survive. But for friends, you know, we don't have to put as much pressure on it because we're not relying on them to survive. And then we turn into teenagers and socially our friends are so important to us and matter so much. And I wondered a lot about, uh, gosh, social media really makes this tricky. So I don't want to interject that too much. Although everyone, we all understand social media is a serious thorn in anyone's side. If you have a child and you're trying to figure out how to navigate that, but Instead of that, what things could a parent tell their child between, you know, 10 to 13 in those integral years of like the cool kids being formed and like the smart kids and the sport guys? Like, what about the kids that don't fit into these genres and they're kind of just floating around trying to find their tribe, feeling really worthless because they have no friends? Like, what would be some things that you would say to a parent to? kind of give them a tip or two on how their child could try to branch out a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. I think I'll back up and just share some framing around this. And I think there are two issues at play here, which one is social isolation. And that's really um, the amount or lack thereof of quality connections that you have in your circle or the lack of frequency of social interactions. And then the second thing here is loneliness, which is a lot more subjective. It's really our perception and our emotional experience um, as a reaction to some of our our social interactions or social circles. Like, so loneliness is really about, um, do we actually feel belonging? Even if we have a wider network of folks that we consider friendships, do they see us? Do they understand us on a deeper level? And I think that this is the predominant issue with younger adults. Um, I know you touched on social media. It's almost a double-edged sword, right? It's we're more connected than ever, but we can also feel um, more lonely and more distanced than ever. And so I think as a parent, what I would really try to communicate to my child if they were struggling with this is that what we want to focus on is it's about the quality of your relationships. It's not about the quantity. Um, So you might see people in school or you might feel left out of these big groups of friends, but at the end of the day, what's going to help you live a happier and healthier life and help you feel seen and help you feel like you belong is if you have a smaller group of friends um, that you can turn to for support and just to go through life with. And the research really shows us that just based on evolution in general, um, we actually can only hold space for anywhere between three to five close, close friends. So those are our best friends that we know we could call in the middle of the night if we're in the middle of a crisis or if our boyfriend just broke up with us or girlfriend and we're going through a really deep heartbreak. Um, Who are those people that we can call and trust to be vulnerable with? And so that's the first thing. I'd say quality over quantity. Um, The next thing is a big issue with individuals having a hard time making friends is that they're not necessarily defining their own interests or their own values for themselves. And so even if, if you're younger and in kind of that high school age or if you're in college, I think it's important to really focus in on yourself and and self-awareness. What do you like? Um, What are you interested in? What are the components of your identity? And then that will better inform the circles that you should be a part of. So for example, a great exercise that I've heard practice before and that I'll share with clients is um, you want to say the phrase, I am, and try to think of at least three identifiers around who you are. So whether I am a mom, I am an artist, I am an entrepreneur, right? Those categories of our identity come in those spaces with other people that share similar identities and similar experiences. Um, Those folks will probably be better fit as far as friends for us in the long run. Even if, again, it, it, 
were not maybe necessarily a part of like this bigger social group that we want to be a part of or that seems like the popular kids. It's more about what's authentic to you at the end of the day. Oh, I love that. So simple. And I think we let fear really get in the way. And it's kind of like, you never forget how to ride a bike, but you could be scared to ride a bike if it's been like, you know, 10 years and then you see a bike and you're like, oh, I got to get on it. But like, you know, you'll know what to do. You just have to like, kind of like crack through that little shell. But it's, it's such good advice. And I would absolutely, so I'm 38, I'll be 39. I'm assuming you're 23, 4, 5? 28. Oh my God. All right. I, well, but I'm flattered. <laughs> yeah. So even at 28, I think, um, I've gone through several phases of almost friendships, like friendship calls. They just kind of grow apart. We're going to different phases of our life. Um, starting with like high school, I, went away for college. A lot of my friends didn't, they stayed here, like ancillary friends, best friends. I'm still best friends with two people from high school. And I am a person that had dozens of friends, maybe hundreds of friends. So you separate from that. Some of those people that stay get married and have children very quickly. So then that's another separation. That's another difference. You go to college, you have your college friends, then you graduate college and your college friends get married or they move into the suburbs or you're splitting apart and people don't live in the same city anymore. There are all of these moments where big life occasions kind of tear you away from other people. And I remember having one friend in particular that after my father passed away, our relationship it became very apparent that our boundaries were not healthy. They were quite toxic. And uh, this person was having a really hard time understanding me kind of separating and pulling away because I was dealing with my grief. So there's just so many times to where there's no real guidebook on how to deal with these sort of things. But what would be some of your best tips for navigating that period and the many periods that will come of you and your friends either growing apart or the parameters of your friendship and your relationship kind of changing or expanding? Absolutely. I think what's really important to remember too is there's research that shows that about every seven years, we go through this natural pruning process where we actually lose about 50% of our friends. Um, and we might end up also gaining new friends. And that is normal. So I think for anybody struggling with, because I, I've gone through it, I'm sure you've gone through it, when anybody loses a friend or feels like they've lost touch, it's really hard to not think about if you were at fault for that relationship fizzling out or ending. And so I think it's important just to remember for everybody that this is a natural part of life. It's a natural process. And we can actually learn to expect that. Um, there's nothing wrong with that if we tend to grow apart from, from some friends. And like you said, we have different phases of life. Some friends will serve purpose. Some friends will serve a certain purpose um, for certain phases of our life. Like when we're younger, we might be going out more. We might be Taco Tuesdaying, right? And it's a lot more of a social um, connection Whereas maybe when we're transitioning into really building up our business or building a family, um, our priorities are going to shift. And so that's, that's completely natural. That's completely okay. I think the second piece of advice is really just to be honest. Um, a friendship is really a mutual agreement that you care about each other enough to have the conversation. So yes, we have different types of friends. Some friends might be more social than others, but I would say if you had a really significant or close friendship and you're feeling like it's starting to shift or change, it is worthwhile and actually communicates your value to the other person of having that conversation about, Hey, you know, I just want to be honest. I'm having a hard time connecting with you lately because I feel like we're in very different phases of life. Or I feel like, I know a big one for a lot of us is, I feel like your worldview has shifted um, and we just don't really see things the same anymore. So I'm having a hard time with that. 
And I value you and love you enough to want to have this conversation. Being honest and direct. And if you both, after this conversation, come to the realization that, hey, our friendship has changed. We might not be as close anymore, but we can both, you know, what a beautiful thing to have that mutual respect and just be able to wish each other well, but also still be able to move forward in a way that serves you and the phase of your life that you're in best. Yeah, that's so beautiful. So beautifully said. I would love to just say to everyone listening, it's okay if you get ghosted by a friend, even a long-term friend, because they may not be in a place where they're able to emotionally or verbally connect or understand or relate to you what's going on and they just got a dip I've had it happen a lot and I took it personally a lot of times and it took me getting older to realize like oh you just couldn't cope with what was going on and you needed to be out so I think that's and that's happened to me so frequently like to the point where I feel like it may be a common <laughs> a common reaction of people they're either going to do, do as you just suggested and, you know, with respect, kind of relay this information as gracefully as they can or they can't. And then they just go away. And then you're like, oh, my God, what happened? We were friends for years. Like we went to college together. So don't take it personally. I, I think in life, don't take anything personally, but especially in friendships that they're, they're changing and evolving could have something to do with you, especially if you're not self-aware and you, you maybe need to do a little personal work for yourself. But it's, uh, I think, always going to be an occasion of where you just have to be happy for the time that you had with them and then be able to move on. So it's a, it's a rough, rough in these streets for, for making friends and keeping friends. But I love that you say that you are an expert at long-term relationships. What are some of the top tips? I know that you have a framework. Let's talk about your five pillars of friendship framework. I would imagine that has a lot to do with having a longevity aspect to a friendship. So tell us about your pillars. And then I would love to know, you know, how you've kept your long-term relationships. Yeah, absolutely. So the five pillars of friendship framework is really what I've created and that I take individual clients through if they're having a hard time making friends in any phase of their adult life. So I primarily work with young adult women in their 20s and 30s. We're going through a lot of self-discovery. We're going through a lot of transitions at this point in their life. Um, so really that foundational first pillar is all about self-awareness and personal growth. So really thinking about and breaking down any limiting beliefs or negative beliefs that you might have either about yourself or about relationships with others that might be getting in the way of you actually starting and embracing a new connection with someone. Um, I think also it's really important in this phase foundationally to define your goals, to define your values, and to think through what do I want out of friendship? What type of friend would uplift, uplift me the most um, at this phase in my life? Where am I going personally? Um, and what type of support do I need as an individual that would better inform the types of friendships that I want to have? So that's really where we start. And then the next pillar is all about education. So there is something called the concentric circles of friendship. Um, and there's really multiple types of friendships. So educating individuals on the different types um, and then the benefits and value of each of those types. So again, we have more of our intimate relationships that can even be our romantic partners, but really those three to five best friends that I talked about earlier. Um, then there is more relational friendships. So that could be anywhere from 10 to 15 individuals. Those could be more of your social friends, um, folks that you hang out with in larger groups versus one-on-ones. You still could talk to them about some of the intimate details of your life, but you might not be as vulnerable or go as deep as you would with your closest friends. And then finally, there's more of a community-based um, relationship or level of friendship. And that can really include acquaintances, that can include maybe your work friends, anybody else that you have a consistent relationship with. Um, and you still gain value from that relationship with them. But again, they're not maybe as close or as personal as some of these other groups of friends. So really thinking through and identifying where might I be lacking in any of these three areas? 
Um, the third pillar is all about then how do we actually connect? How do we communicate with each other? So really thinking about effective communication skills, which includes active listening. Um, it includes diving deeper and the amount of time it takes to really be vulnerable and open up with one another. And how do you tactically do that? Going from a stranger to, again, a deeper connection. The fourth way is more about tactical and tangible strategies of how to make friends. So we know how to connect, we know how to communicate, how do we find people? Um, so really thinking through different groups you can join, different community events and strategies that you can use in the circles that you're already in, um, tapping into your existing networks. So if you live in an apartment building, if you go to a gym, anywhere that you're frequent, um, frequently involved with, that you would see the same types of people, how can we start to build and grow relationships from that that place when we have kind of warm leads, so to speak. Um, and then finally, the last pillar is all about retaining friendships and relationships. I think, again, like we've touched on, you're not going to retain every friendship and that's okay. So this pillar also covers how to gracefully let go and accept relationship or friendship transitions. Um, but then also understanding the foundations for maintaining relationships. So to answer your original question, there are so many ways that we can stay connected, even if we have more of these long distance friendships. And it really comes down to consistency and support. Um, so for women, the number one thing that we are seeking out of friendships is emotional support. And we need to then define what does that actually look like and how does that apply to the friendships that we have? Is that regular in-person hangouts or touch points? Is that making sure that we're celebrating each other's milestones and successes? If someone graduates grad school or gets married, has a baby, how can we be present and supportive in those moments? Um, and also just consistency with check-ins. So making sure that our friendships and the relationships that we've built, they're a priority and that we're not taking them for granted. Interesting too first grades so we're maybe seven or 38 now so we'll say quite some time 31 years and we've gone years maybe a year or two with nothing more than like a little Facebook like like or comment here or there because we are just busy living life um, and every time we are with each other it's like we just pick right back up again um, and both of the relationships that I still have from childhood are that way it feels very interesting to have other friends that I see more regularly. I'm meeting up with them for coffee once or twice a month. You know, we'll go to the beach together in the summertime. Like there's varying levels into the intimacy part that comes in. And I wonder if for you, does intimacy in a friendship kind of almost lean towards it, there being more longevity because you kind of have more rapport and experience together or where does that kind of flesh out in terms of what kind of friendships go the distance? Absolutely. I really think it can be both. I think there's both history and proximity when it comes to our long-term friends. Um, I think with history, when you have opportunities to build memories with each other year over year over year, if you've had that experience of going through these forming years together, growing up together, that will forever link you in ways that maybe some of our new friends in adulthood do not. However, proximity is not a bad thing and that can also serve the same purpose. So if you are a new mom and you have recently joined a mom's group and have made some new friends with great women in this group that are sharing a similar experience as you, but maybe some of those friends, best friends that you have history with are not yet moms. I think there's an opportunity there where your relationship can be deeper in a different way. And so I really think intimacy is all about where you're willing to be vulnerable and how much you're able to build trust with the other person. Um, 
I don't think it's necessarily only time or only proximity. I think it's, sorry, I just blanked a little bit, but um, yeah, I, I don't think it's only time or proximity. It's really comes down to what's most important for you, what you're able to connect on deeply and then continued opportunities to further that connection that you've made. Mm, it makes a lot of sense. It does. Oh, I love when you talk about hypervigilance and friendships. Yes. Can you break that down for everyone and just go off a little bit on it? Because I love that you talk about this. Yeah, absolutely. So hypervigilance for anyone that's not as familiar is it can stem from anxiety and it can also stem from your upbringing. So say you were raised in a home that, or with caregivers that might've been a little bit more unpredictable emotionally, you are learning from a young age or through more stressful or anxiety inducing experiences, how to read the room in order to prevent conflict. So you are attentive to a lot of nonverbal cues, things like body language, facial expressions, tone of voice, anything that might indicate where somebody's emotional state is at that point in time. And I think, again, if you did grow up and develop these tendencies as an adult, you might lean more into people pleasing. And this is because you have this unique ability that allows you to more or less predict the outcome of how your behavior or what you say will impact somebody else and the emotional reaction that you will elicit from them. And so everybody wants to be liked. Everybody wants to be accepted. Everybody wants to be happy. Um, and so more often than not, if we know or have this intuition that if we behave in a certain way or if we say something in a certain way, it might make our friends angry or it might make our friends upset, we will revert to different types of behavior in order to keep them happy and to keep them um, in our good graces. And so that's really what hypervigilance looks like. And I think as it turns into people pleasing, what we can experience and what's really tough with friendships is a lack of boundaries. So within friendships, it's interesting because we view them as this optional mutual relationship, right? So it's different from a family member or maybe a partner where you have a solidified commitment that no matter what I say, no matter how I act, they're still going to be present in my life. With friendships, we don't have that necessarily. And so there's this expectation that, or I guess I would say we have varying expectations that are individual to us on what makes a good friend. And so some person might view being a good friend as, hey, if I'm really having a tough day, if I'm struggling with this, I need you to drop everything, come over, sit with me, and help me get through this difficult point in my life. That's a lot to ask of and, and expect of a friend. Um, but if that is what they define as being a good friend, then of course you on the other side of that relationship, you don't want to be a bad friend to them. So you will tend to do whatever elicits that positive response um, for them. So yeah, it, it's very interesting. I think it's more important as we become adults to be clear and set boundaries around what we need and what our expectations of support look like, what our expectations of friendship look like, so that we don't burn each other out. We stay in a mutually beneficial relationship. And, um, you know, ultimately we're respecting each other more at the end of the day and what we need. It is really uh, an interesting turn in a friendship when you kind of are ready to put your foot down in essence and start to put boundaries in place and were there before. And the boundary placing journey can feel really awkward and weird if you've never done it before. An occasion over the last six stressed me out. I can't deal with this anymore. I put my foot down. 
and they immediately were like, oh my God, okay, I didn't mean, like, I didn't mean for it to come off like that, or, you know, like, backpedaling, and, like, oh, wow, like, that's not what I, rea- like, expected from you reaction-wise, and I tell you what, the friendship has been absolutely wonderful since that moment. I think there was just a bit of a reconciliation of me not wanting to be so available for things and them needing to maybe take a little bit more of their own emotional weight to kind of deal with the thing they were used to me helping them deal with. Um, I wonder if for you, do you educate your, your um, clients on like attachment bonds and, and kind of how friends can bond together when they're both kind of experiencing the same point of self journey or self-discovery to where, you know, one could grow out of it, one could not. Like, could, could you touch on that just a little bit? Because I think that is a huge part of friendships in your 20s that doesn't really get discussed. Absolutely. Yeah. I think attachment theory is really interesting. I don't necessarily focus on it too, too deep um, just because mostly what I've learned or researched about it has been in the context of romantic relationships, but it does apply. Um, so thinking about there are typically sometimes more anxious friends, maybe some more independent or avoidant friends, and then some friends that are really secure or relationships that are really secure. I think what's interesting about anxious attachment and this whole concept of setting boundaries is that we are... Um, I don't know if subconsciously is the right word, but we're assuming that if we set a boundary and communicate our needs directly with a friend, that we are somehow then subliminally communicating that they are not as important to us, that we don't care about them, that we don't value them enough. And that's not the case. Um, So I think it's really important for folks that do tend to lean more in the anxious attachment category um, that might experience hypervigilance. It's a good reminder that we are adults and your friend is responsible for communicating to you how you are affecting them and if they feel neglected, as are we. So we are also then responsible for communicating our needs to our friends to make them understand um, what we actually need in the moment and what will better benefit our relationship. Man, I could talk to you for forever, but we have a hard stop. So I'm going to ask you our last question that I ask all of our guests. Carrie, how do you make your life rich? I love this question. And I love that your podcast is named the Make Life Rich Podcast um, because I think this topic of friendships is so important. You know, the longest study that has ever been conducted out of Harvard on human happiness uh, really shares that our friendships, the quality of our friendships and our social connections is the number one factor of what allows us to live happier and healthier lives. And so I, as I've grown my practice, have become so much more intentional about how I continue to foster and grow my current relationships as well as take risks, branch out, and just try to be kind to somebody new. Um, And, you know, really maintaining that open mindset has allowed wonderful connections and wonderful people to come into my life and benefit my life in ways that I didn't think was possible before um, than it would have if I were closed off or just maintaining, you know, my circle or my day-to-day and focusing on myself as an individual. So I would really say like becoming more intentional and really viewing friendships as a key component of something that will help me thrive as an individual has just made my life more rich. Oh, Carrie, that's so beautiful. Guys, you can visit the show notes to get in touch with Carrie and work with her at the Kindred Collective. If you feel like you are ready to put in the work and kind of work on yourself and work on establishing better relationships and friendships in your life, then Carrie is the woman for the job. And after today's conversation, I am sure that you are already feeling a little bit more comfortable making some friends today. So in the Starbucks line, you know, just a little like, oh, beautiful weather we're having, you know, just if you're at TJ Maxx, just, oh my God, I love that bathing suit cover. Are you going on vacation? Like it's 
just just lead with your heart and pretend you're five and that can take you really far when making new friends yep. especially in line so carrie thank you so much for just your time and this topic is so beautiful i cannot wait to see where it takes you personally and uh thank you for helping people to make friends it's so important thank you so much sarah it was great chatting with you more today